Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing valvular heart disease. Okay, so what I now want to do is uh, discuss the consequences of having valvular heart disease, the consequences of having any one of these four heart valves either stenosed or regurgitating. And I think it's going to be best if we go back to our original picture, our basic picture of the heart over here. Okay, our physiologist picture. Right, so let's go through each one of the valves and think about what the consequences will overall be of stenosis or regurgitation. So let's start off with the tricuspid valve. Okay, so if the tricuspid valve is stenosed, that will mean that the right atrium struggles to pump blood into the right ventricle. So less blood will be moved from the right atrium to the right ventricle. Overall, what will this mean? It will mean that the heart is going to be less efficient. If the right atrium is moving less blood into the right ventricle, then that means that the overall amount of blood that's going to be moved through the entire heart, so from the venous system to the arterial system, is going to go down. Okay, and this is really the message that I want to convey about all of valvular heart disease. So let's continue on, and you'll hopefully get the message drilled into if I go through all eight uh, scenarios. Now let's talk about tricuspid regurgitation. If the tricuspid valve is regurgitating, then that means that when the right atrium relaxes, you're now going to get blood coming back from the right ventricle to the right atrium. That's blood flowing in the wrong direction. Okay, that means that the amount of blood that the right ventricle is now going to pump into the pulmonary arterial system is going to be reduced because lots of the blood has gone back into the right atrium. What, again, is that overall going to mean, looking at the big picture? It means that the amount of blood that the heart moves from the venous to the arterial system, the systemic venous to the systemic arterial system, is reduced. Okay, same theme. Cardiac output is going down. Now, let's do the next one, pulmonary valve. So, pulmonary valve stenosis will mean that the right ventricle will move less blood into the pulmonary arterial system. Again, that will mean, overall, that cardiac output will go down. If we've got pulmonary artery regurgitation, then that means that when the right ventricle relaxes, right ventricular diastole, uh, then blood from the pulmonary arterial system will come back into the right ventricle in the wrong direction. Again, that will overall mean that the amount of blood the heart is moving from the venous to the arterial system will be reduced the cardiac output will go down. Let's go to the next one, the mitral valve here. So if we've got mitral valve stenosis, then the left atrium isn't going to move as much blood into the left ventricle. Again, that's overall going to mean that the amount of blood the heart is moving from the venous to the arterial system is going to go down. Cardiac output will go down. Mitral regurgitation, blood will move back from the left ventricle into the left atrium in the wrong direction. Again, that will mean cardiac output will go down. Aortic stenosis, that means the left ventricle is going to pump less blood into the aorta, um, and that, of course, is going to mean that the heart is going to move less blood from the venous system to the arterial system, cardiac output will go down. Aortic valve regurgitation, then when the left ventricle relaxes, blood will come back from the arterial system into the left ventricle, Again, that will mean that cardiac output goes down. So there is the message that I wanted to absolutely drill into you from that little discussion there. That overall, what both of these lead to, and I'll get a colour that's worthy of the importance of this, all of this, valvular heart disease, in whatever valve, whether it's stenosis or regurgitation, it leads to cardiac output going down. Okay, so CO is cardiac output, the amount of blood that the heart moves in a minute from the systemic venous system to the systemic arterial system is going to be reduced. Now, what's the result of reducing cardiac output? Well, the big result is that now mean arterial pressure is going to go down. So let's just draw a little flow diagram. So if cardiac output goes down, mean arterial pressure goes down. So the mean pressure in the systemic arterial system is going to go down. Now, why is that? Well, remember, mean arterial pressure is usually around 93 millimetres of mercury. It's quite high. And the reason it's maintained at that is because of the cardiac output. It's only maintained so high because the heart continuously pumps blood from the venous system into the arterial system. If the heart wasn't there, this pressure would be the mean systemic pressure, 7 millimetres of mercury, and the venous pressure would be 7 millimetres of mercury as well. The reason there's a 
do you know that the mean venous pressure is 5 millimetres of mercury and the mean arterial pressure is 93 millimetres of mercury? It's because the car continuously takes bucket loads of blood and dumps them, takes them from the venous system and dumps them into the arterial system. If it slows down how much blood it is do it's moving from the venous to the arterial system, then of course the pressure, the, how high the pressure is in the arterial system will go down. What does that then mean? And it would be helpful, I think, to go back to my picture of the cardiovascular system over here. So, if mean arterial pressure goes down, what does that mean? Well, that means, of course, that the amount of blood that will flow from the arterial system to the venous system through peripheral capillaries is going to go down. So the blood flow is actually going to go down from the arterial system to the venous system. And that's going to have uh, serious consequences because that means the tissue perfusion is going to go down. So let's go over here. So mean arterial pressure going down and up. Whoops, let me undo that. I want to zoom out. So mean arterial pressure going down is going to result in tissue perfusion going down. So the amount of blood that's actually flowing through peripheral tissues is going to go down. Of course, fundamentally, that's what the cardiovascular system is for. It's to perfuse tissues. So if the tissue perfusion is going down, that's a big, big problem. Right. Now, when you're at rest, what will happen is there will be physiological responses to compensate for this. In particular, there is a response that occurs when the mean arterial pressure goes down, which is that the sympathetic nervous system becomes activated and stimulates the heart. So when mean arterial pressure is reduced because of the valvular heart disease, what this will result in is it will activate the sympathetic nervous system. So this is the baroreceptor reflex. Uh, so it will activate the SNS, which is the sympathetic nervous system. Specifically, it will activate the sympathetic nervous system that innervates the heart. Uh, and you'll get the release of noradrenaline onto the heart. And this results in two major things. It results in the heart rate going up. So sympathetic nervous system innervation to the heart will go up. This will lead to the heart rate going up and it will cause tachycardia. So tachy means fast, uh, cardia means, what well, means referring to the heart, so fast heartbeat is what tachycardia means. So I can just put that heart rate will be increased. And it will also increase the force of contraction of the heart, so it will increase the inotropy of the heart, which means when the heart contracts, how hard does it actually contract? So what will happen when you have this valvular heart disease and the heart overall is now not functioning as well, cardiac output is going to go down, the way the body will compensate for this, and this is a very nice piece of terminology that is used all over medicine, we say that the body compensates for it, it makes up for the fact that the heart isn't functioning as well. The way that it compensates at rest, and this is what the important bit is here, it compensates at rest, so when you're not exercising, when you're resting, it compensates for it by increasing the sympathetic nervous system activation to the heart. You'll get more um, noradrenaline released onto the heart, and this will cause the heart rate to go up and the force of contraction of all of the heart chambers to go up. And these two things will have to bring back up cardiac output, because remember, cardiac output is just equal to heart rate times stroke volume. An increase in inotropy will result in an increase in stroke volume, an increase in how much blood the heart moves from the venous system to the arterial system with each beat. Okay, uh, That's because all of the chambers are now going to be pumping harder, so they'll pump a bigger fraction of blood out of them. Um, an increase in heart rate is also therefore going to help increase cardiac output, because cardiac output is these two things times together. This is how much blood the heart moves from the venous to the arterial system in a single beat. This is how many times it beats in a minute. So times the two together and you get how much blood it moves in a minute. Okay, so increasing both of these things is going to help bring cardiac output back up. So uh, how should I do this? Both of these things will help rectify this. So... Okay, so they'll help to bring cardiac output back up, bring mean arterial pressure back up, and therefore bring tissue perfusion back up. But the key thing here is that this is at rest. So at rest, 
you're now going to have chronic overactivation of the sympathetic nervous system when you've got valvular heart disease. And this is so that you can compensate for the fact that the heart is broken, the valves are broken, and the heart's not uh, working as well as it should have done. So now the sympathetic nervous system's having to make it work harder to compensate for uh, its brokenness. Okay, right. So, that's all very interesting, but what does this actually mean? This causes a problem when you exercise, because normally when you exercise, your cardiac output has to go up further, and the way that you normally do this is by raising the sympathetic input to the heart. But now we've already got raised sympathetic input to the heart, so it's going to lead to a problem. You're going to get uh, it no longer uh, managing to compensate. So, let's make a little bit more space. So, uh, we'll go up, I think. So now, let's take the scenario that we exercise. So we start exercising, and this isn't necessarily strenuous exercise. This might just be walking up a hill, maybe a mild hill, or just walking at all. So we begin exercise. Now what normally happens when you exercise? So, when you normally exercise, you're using your skeletal muscle. And uh, normally the skeletal muscle isn't being used that much, so it has a very low blood supply when you're at rest. However, when you start exercising, it has to now have a larger blood supply because it's being used. So all of the blood vessels in the skeletal muscle start dilatating. They dilate, and therefore blood is going to go from the arterial system to the venous system through those. What this overall means in terms of the cardiovascular system is that we are reducing... Um, where is it? The total peripheral resistance. We are reducing how difficult it is for blood to go from the arterial system to the venous system. If you like, what we're doing is we're opening up loads of collateral capillaries, loads more capillaries, which are draining blood from the arterial system to the venous system. So overall, the amount of blood that will be moving from the arterial system to the venous system is going to get much greater. So it makes it much easier for blood to return from the arterial system to the venous system. This means that arterial blood pressure is going to go down because now a lot more blood is going to be moving from the arterial system back to the venous system in a single cycle time. So you'll end up losing blood from here um, and the pressure will therefore go down. Okay, right, so that's now, uh, and indeed actually there's an equation that I don't think I gave you when we were doing this um, initial discussion of the um, cardiovascular system, which is that cardiac output is equal to the pressure difference. Okay, so let me just talk you through this. So here's this equation for flow. The amount of flow back from the arterial system to the venous system is equal to the pressure difference divided by the resistance, which is the total peripheral resistance. At dynamic equilibrium, the amount of blood flowing through the peripheral capillaries has to equal the cardiac output. So we can fill in for flow cardiac output at dynamic equilibrium. Then we have pressure difference, and strictly speaking, pressure difference should be mean arterial pressure take away mean venous pressure. However, mean venous pressure is pathetic compared to mean arterial pressure, uh, which is here. Um, so we might as well, to simplify it down, just put mean arterial pressure and not bother subtracting off the mean venous pressure. Strictly speaking, we should, but it will give you a more complicated equation if you do that, whereas this gives you a beautiful, simple equation. So as an approximation, that's just put in mean arterial pressure there and forget the subtracting off the five millimetres of mercury, which is mean venous pressure. And then we need to divide it by TPR, total peripheral resistance. So this gives us a nice equation for what the mean arterial pressure will be at dynamic equilibrium, because we can now just rearrange this to mean arterial pressure is going to equal the cardiac output times the total peripheral resistance. And this makes, whoops, total peripheral resistance. And this makes complete sense, because look at what this says. It says how big mean arterial pressure is depends on cardiac output. The bigger cardiac output is, the bigger this will be, obviously, because this is maintained by you moving blood from the venous system to the arterial system. The more blood you move, of course, the higher this will be. And it's dependent on the total peripheral resistance, which is how difficult is it for blood to move back from the arterial system to the venous system. The higher this is, the higher mean arterial pressure is, which again makes sense. Uh, because if it's harder for blood to return, then more blood will remain here, and therefore mean arterial pressure will get higher. 
we are effectively reducing this down now, and therefore mean arterial pressure is going to be reduced. So where am I? Here's my new flow diagram. So here, in exercise, what's going to happen? Mean arterial pressure is therefore going to go down. In fact, I've missed out a step there. Let me undo this. I'll put in an extra step. So in exercise, total peripheral resistance goes down, and I've explained why that is. It's because all of those blood vessels in the skeletal muscle are now dilatating because they want blood to flow through them uh, to increase the perfusion to the skeletal muscle. So total peripheral resistance will go down. Because of the equation that I've just explained, that will mean mean arterial pressure will go down. And now normally what should happen in a healthy person is the way we deal with this is the sympathetic nervous system should come on, okay? And this should now um, do exactly the same thing as we've just discussed to the heart. It should increase the heart rate and increase the inotropy of the heart, increase the force of contraction of the heart so that cardiac output goes up. So this should result in cardiac output going up and therefore it should rectify this. It should bring the mean arterial pressure back up. So normally, the way that you deal with exercise is by increasing the sympathetic stimulation to the heart, increasing the cardiac output, and therefore increasing the mean arterial pressure back up so that you maintain mean arterial pressure and therefore you maintain tissue perfusion. Because you have to understand, if this falls, then tissue perfusion to everything falls. Okay, You might have increased tissue perfusion to the skeletal muscle cells, but now tissue perfusion to the brain and the heart and all the other incredibly important organs will start to fall if this goes down. So you don't want it to fall. You need to maintain this, okay, because this is what maintains tissue perfusion. You basically asked to increase the tissue perfusion, so you now need to do something that's going to help to maintain this in the face of that increased tissue perfusion. Okay, so this is what happens in someone who's perfectly healthy, in someone with the healthy the heart disease, then the sympathetic nervous system is already activated at rest. So now when you exercise, again, this is going to happen. Total peripheral resistance is going to go down. Mean arterial pressure is going to down, go down. But the sympathetic nervous system now can't be put on any higher. It's already on as very high. So you can't really increase sympathetic stimulation to the heart any further so you can't increase cardiac outputs. So you don't get this rectification to mean arterial pressure. So the flow diagram ends here. Mean arterial pressure goes down. And what does that then lead to? It leads to not enough blood going to the brain and not enough blood going to the heart. And those are the two most essential organs and they're the two that give you symptoms. So what are the symptoms that you get then if you've got valvular heart disease and you try to exercise? Here's the answer. So because you're not getting enough blood to the brain, what that's going to lead to is lightheadedness. So feeling as though you're about to faint. Whoops, light, oh, I'll just undo that. Lightheadedness, and maybe even fainting. So it might even result in loss of consciousness, syncope. Okay, and that's because mean arterial pressure has gone down, so now the perfusion to the brain has been reduced. Okay, so that's the result this on the brain and now also the result of this on the heart if the heart doesn't get enough perfusion we know what this causes this is very famous um, the same thing that you get in ischemic heart disease but now for a different reason you're going to get the crushing chest pain which is characteristic of myocardial ischemia so uh, chest pain uh, or angina, you can call it, which is the strangling, gripping chest pain uh, around where the heart is that radiates up to the shoulders, particularly the left shoulder and the uh, underneath of the jaw. Okay, so chest pain, angina, which is the heart not getting enough blood. So this is the result of not enough blood getting to the heart. Okay, so those are the two major consequences of exercising with valvular heart disease, that you simply can't compensate for exercising anymore because the sympathetic nervous system, which is the mechanism by which you normally compensate for exercise in a healthy body, is already at 
working as hard as it can to compensate for you just when you're at rest because the heart isn't functioning properly. So these are two of the major symptoms of valvular heart disease, that you get lightheaded when you try and exercise and you get crushing chest pain, the myocardial ischemic chest pain uh, when you try and exercise. Okay, right. So those are two of the consequences then of valvular heart disease. Now I want to talk about the horrible long-term one which is that it can lead to heart failure. Okay, so let's go over this. So, I will just put the title firstly. So, we'll put it um, in green here. So, I now want to discuss heart failure, which for short I'll abbreviate down to HF. Okay, so, we will start by discussing the effect of the valvular heart disease on the chamber that is right next to the diseased, va diseased valve. So if we're talking, for instance, about aortic valve disease, then the biggest affected chamber, the first affected chamber, is going to be the left ventricle. If we're talking about mitral valve disease, then the biggest first affected chamber is going to be the right atrium. If we're talking about pulmonary valve disease, then the biggest first affected chamber will be the right ventricle. And if we're talking about tricuspid valve disease, then the first biggest affected chamber is going to be the right atrium. Okay, so that's the chamber that's going to be affected first. So let me go back to my basic picture of the cardiovascular system here. So let's do an example then. Let's start off with the classical example. Let's say you've got aortic valve disease, and as we'll see later, one of the most common forms of valvular heart disease is aortic stenosis. It is the most common form of valvular heart disease. So if you've got a problem with the aortic valve, either aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation, what it's overall going to mean for the chamber just before it, so the left ventricle in this case, is that this chamber is really going to struggle if you've got stenosed valve here, then it's really going to struggle to pump the blood out. If you've got regurgitation, then it's, you know, a poor chamber, it's pumping the blood out, and then it's coming back, poor thing. So it's, it's not having an easy time, the chamber that's in front of the diseased valve, equivalently for all the other valves. So if we've got mitral valve disease, then the left atrium has a hard time. Whether it's stenosis or regurgitation, the left atrium has a hard time. If we're talking about pulmonary valve disease, whether it's stenosis or regurgitation, the right ventricle has a hard time. If we're talking about tricuspid valve disease, whether it's stenosis or regurgitation, the right atrium has a hard time. So, the chamber before the diseased heart valve has a difficult time. And this leads to its undergoing a process called hypertrophy. And this hypertrophy makes things better for a while. It buys you a bit of time. Unfortunately, it's like something that evolution hasn't fully perfected. It works for a while, and then overall in the long term, it makes things worse. And this starts a chronic, vicious cycle called heart failure. And that's what we're now going to discuss. So, I shouldn't have put this so far away from that useful... Um, model over there, but never mind. Okay, so let's draw a flow diagram then for this. So heart failure. We start off with valvular heart disease, so VHD, and what this is going to lead to is it's going to lead to the chamber in front of the diseased valve becoming, uh, well, struggling. So this leads to um, um, what should I put? Um, in front chamber. So I'm just going to put chamber. Chamber struggling. And let's now think about what uh, is going to happen to this struggling chamber. So the chamber that is struggling, and let's go back to our example of aortic stenosis, it will be the left ventricle in that case. What will happen is that that chamber will undergo a process called hypertrophy. And I now need to explain to you what is meant by hypertrophy. So the struggling chamber undergoes hypertrophy. So let's discuss hypertrophy. So hypertrophy means that all of the cardiomyocytes in the wall of that chamber are going to get bigger. So I'm going to draw a little picture of this. So if we have a picture here of a cardiomyocyte, what can happen is the cardiomyocytes can, end, can get bigger. So they can go from being lit like this to being, let's say, like this. Maybe this is a little bit exaggerated, but it gets the point across. So 
Cardiac hypertrophy refers to the cells in the wall of the heart actually getting bigger. They get longer and they also get thicker, okay? And this occurs in response to the heart struggling. So when a chamber struggles, as indeed it will, if the valve ahead of it is uh, broken, is diseased, then the way it deals with this is it makes all of the cardiomyocytes in its wall get thicker and bigger in this way. It makes them hypertrophy. So what's gradually going to happen in the chamber that is struggling is that you're going to get this hypertrophy, this engorging of these cells. Now, why does this happen? Well, it's brilliant at the start, absolutely brilliant, because these new larger cardiomyocytes here, these hypertrophied cardiomyocytes, and I'll write its name down here. So this is a hypertrophied cardiomyocyte. It's stronger. It's better at doing its job. It's capable of creating more force. So when this thing contracts, the amount of force that it generates is better. And why is that going to help? Well, that means that this struggling chamber becomes stronger. So when the chamber undergoes hypertrophy, what's going to now happen is its strength increases hugely. And that's going to help it. That's going to stop it struggling. So let's now say we're discussing the left ventricle. The left ventricle with aortic stenosis, previously it was really struggling to eject the blood through the stenosed aortic valve here. Now, once this has undergone hypertrophy, it will be stronger and it will be able to force more blood through that stenosed valve. So this might actually help to restore heart function back to normal, even in the face of this valvular heart disease, the problem with the valve. Uh, so it does look brilliant at the start. The problem is it's only brilliant at the start. It gets worse over time. So let me now tell you the downside. So overall, valvular heart disease leads to the um, chamber in front of that valve struggling, and it undergoes hypertrophy, and this increases its strength, and it looks as though it's going to repair everything. It will bring the amount of blood that that heart um, chamber is overall ejecting through the diseased valve back up to normal. The problem is that over time, this deteriorates. So, strength goes up, but I'm now going to have to add on to this only initially. So your strength goes up initially. In the long term, it goes the other way. So in the long term, the strength goes down, and there is a lot of research still as to why this actually happens to these hypertrophied cardiomyocytes. So strength goes down in the long term. So unfortunately, it is really like something that nature has not quite perfected. It works for a while, it buys you a little bit of time. So when a cardiomyocyte undergoes this hypertrophy process, it initially becomes stronger, but then in the long term, it becomes weaker, and it almost completely loses the ability to contract in the long term. And as I say, there is a lot of research in calcium signaling laboratories, in which I actually did a research project at one point, uh, into why this actually occurs, um, what actually causes it, these uh, hypertrophy cardiomyocytes to lose their ability to contract. And it is thought to be that all of the calcium signaling apparatus, which is really important for coupling, coupling electrical activation of the cardiomyocyte to actual contraction of the cardiomyocyte, um, that breaks, basically. Okay, so in the long term, then, the strength of these hypertrophy cardiomyocytes decreases, and that overall means that the uh, strength of the chamber is going to get worse, and this is the vicious cycle of heart failure. So strength goes down, and this means that the chamber struggles even more. So this brings chamber struggling up. And this is what we refer to as heart failure, a vicious cycle of the heart getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And you can imagine how it's going to go round and round in a cycle because as the chamber gets weaker, it's going to provoke more and more of the cardiomyocytes to undergo hypertrophy. And therefore, Initially, it will provide a little bit of added strength, but over the long term, it will mean that the heart is just that heart chamber is just getting weaker and weaker and weaker. So I should stress that 
when I say the chamber undergoes hypertrophy, it won't be the case that all the cardiomyocytes instantly undergo hypertrophy all at the same time. It'll be that gradually some of them are undergoing hypertrophy, they're losing their ability to contract in the long term, and then more of them undergo the hypertrophy process, they lose the ability to contract, and gradually that chamber is just going to become weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and worse and worse at actually pumping blood out. Okay, so this is heart failure. This is what causes heart failure. So it's the chamber just in front of the diseased heart valve that is going to undergo this process first. However, one chamber undergoing this process generally leads to another chamber undergoing this process. And let me explain why. So it really is annoying me that I didn't do this closer to where I actually have my nice model of the cardiovascular system. So... Let's imagine that we are talking either about the left ventricle or the right ventricle, so a ventricle initially. Okay, so let's say we've either got aortic valve disease, which is causing left ventricular failure, or we've got pulmonary valve disease, which is causing right ventricular failure in the way that I've just described. What that will then lead to is left atrial failure or right atrial failure. So left ventricular failure will lead to left atrial failure and right ventricular failure will lead to right atrial failure. So basically, if a ventricle fails, its atrium also fails automatically. And hopefully you can understand the reason. If Let's take the example of the left ventricle. If the left ventricle is failing, if it's getting weaker and weaker, then it's losing its ability to pump blood into the systemic arterial system, okay? Um, and therefore, blood's going to be just maintained... Well, it's just going to be staying in the left ventricle rather than actually going into the arterial system. So it's going to be pumping less and less blood into the arterial system, so more and more of that will just be staying in the left ventricle. That means that now the left atrium is going to have a really hard time pushing blood into the left ventricle. So it's now going to start struggling in the same way. Uh, oh, and by the way, something that I didn't say when I was actually talking about the hypertrophy process. It's not actually understood quite what underlies the actual change to hypertrophy, i.e. all the signalling, how a cell decides to undergo hypertrophy. That's a massive area of research as well, um, why cardiomyocytes undergo hypertrophy and all the signalling pathways inside. But what we do know is that when a heart chamber is struggling, what seems to happen is that the cells start to undergo hypertrophy. How all of the signalling that underlies that, it's still being worked out. Okay, so now when the left ventricle struggles, hopefully you can understand the left atrium is now going to struggle as well um, because it can no longer pump blood into the left ventricle because the left, well, it can't pump as much blood into the left ventricle because the left ventricle is not pumping as much blood into the arterial system. So the sympathy isn't as much room for blood. So that will then lead to the left atrium struggling. It will start undergoing the hypertrophy process, so it will start to go into the vicious cycle of failure as well. And the exact same thing holds true for the right ventricle with the right atrium. So when a ventricle starts failing, it leads to the atrium next to it failing as well. And I'll just go back all the way over here and put that in. Okay, so I'll jot this down, and we'll do it in blue, I think. So... When a ventricle fails, I'll put ventricular failure. Ventricular failure, it generally leads to atrial failure. The atrium that's just above it. Okay, so atrial failure as well. Okay, right. The other thing that I want to say is that if the left heart fails, it generally also leads to the right heart failing. So, firstly... Because we now know that when a ventricle fails, the atrium next to it fails as well, we can now talk about each side of the heart failing. So we can talk now about left heart failure and right heart failure, because as I've explained, if the ventricle fails, which is often usually the case, uh, then the atrium will fail as well. So you might get entire left-sided heart failure. Okay, so left heart failure and right heart failure we can talk about. Now what I want to talk about is if the left atrium fails, it generally leads to the right ventricle failing and then of course the right atrium failing. So left atrial failure, uh, which is usually a result of left ventricular failure because often the ventricles 
are the ones that are involved. Um, left atrial failure will lead to right heart failure. So let me discuss why this is. So back to the picture of the cardiovascular system. So if you can imagine, the left atrium is now failing. So it's failing to pump blood into the left ventricle here. What that will overall lead to is blood backing up in the pulmonary venous system. So it will lead to pulmonary venous pressure going up. And in fact, I think I will just start drawing this here, despite the fact that my other discussion of heart failure is all the way over there. So let's draw a flow diagram of this. So if we've got left atrial failure, what this will lead to is the mean pulmonary venous pressure going up. So mean pulmonary venous pressure will go up because blood will start to back up in the uh, pulmonary venous system because we're imagining at this point that we've just got left atrial failure, maybe secondary to left ventricular failure, but we haven't got right-sided heart failure. So you can imagine, if you like, we've got aortic stenosis, that's caused the left ventricle to fail, that's caused the left atrium to fail, and we're now uh, trying to understand what this is going to have what effect this will have on the right heart. And the effect is that pulmonary venous pressure is going to start going up because the right heart is still pumping blood into the pulmonary system. That will be returning from the arterial system into the pulmonary venous system, and then it's not moving as fast through the left heart as the right heart is moving it. So you're going to get blood accumulating here, so that will lead to the mean pulmonary venous pressure going up. Now, the pulmonary venous system is not nowhere near as large as the systemic venous system. So when this starts to go up, it's going to mean, when the pressure of this starts going up, it means that the amount of blood flowing through the pulmonary capillaries is going to go down. Uh, and there, because the pressure difference between the pulmonary arterial system and the pulmonary venous system has gone down, and remember, flow is the difference in pressure over the resistance. Resistance is the same, but the pressure difference has gone down, so flow will go down. So that overall means that blood's going to back up into the pulmonary arterial system. So this is now going to lead to mean pulmonary arterial pressure going down, and now this, is, sorry, mean pulmonary arterial pressure going up, I beg your pardon, um, and this is now going to lead to right heart failure. Because the right ventricle is now having to pump blood into a pulmonary arterial system that has an increased pressure. It is not easy to pump blood into a pulmonary arterial system if the pressure is much higher than it should be. So the right ventricle now struggles to do that. It will start undergoing the hypertrophy process, and therefore the right atrium will fail for the same reason as we've already gone over, and therefore you'll get right heart failure. So this leads to right and I'll just put RHF for right heart failure. Okay, so what have I discussed through now? I've discussed what the vicious cycle of heart failure is. It's when a heart chamber is struggling, and there are loads of different reasons the heart chamber can struggle. Uh, for instance, the same thing happens if we're discussing... Um, arterial system hypertension, so pathological hypertension, completely different topic, but the same thing happens. The left ventricle will struggle and you'll begin the process of heart failure. It also happens following myocardial infarctions where portions of the heart wall die. That leads to chambers struggling to pump blood and then it begins the process of heart failure. So there are loads of different things that can lead to heart failure. We're discussing it in the context of valvular heart disease, it all being initiated by valvular heart disease. So, um, if you have ventricular... Uh, well, if a chamber is struggling, it's going to begin the process of heart failure. It will start hypertrophying its cardiomyocytes. They get better initially. It's fantastic initially. It solves the problem initially, but over a long time, they lose the ability to contract almost completely, so they become useless. And that means that gradually the wall gets weaker and weaker, more cardiomyocytes undergo the hypertrophy process, weaker, 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 and it just descends and descends and descends until the heart is totally useless. Uh, and that's when you've gone into full-blown heart failure. The heart is failing the rest of the body. It's failing to do what it's meant to do in the body. Okay, we've discussed that if you have um, heart failure of a ventricle, it will lead to the heart failure of that of the atrium before it, and we've also discussed that if you have left atrial failure, what that will lead to is right ventricular failure and right atrial failure. Now, I'd just like to add a little bit more onto this discussion. 
because when the mean pulmonary venous pressure goes up, this means that the pressure of the blood in the pulmonary capillaries, and we don't usually talk about this, but it's important to acknowledge that it's there. The arterial system has a pressure, the venous system has a pressure, that pr there is a pressure inside the capillaries themselves, the pulmonary capillaries. And because the mean pulmonary venous pressure has gone up, this pressure will be increased. So you have to understand that as you move from here to here, the pressure of the blood in the vessels goes from being the pressure in the pulmonary arterial system to being the pressure in the pulmonary venous system, so it gradually goes down. If this thing's elevated, then it's not going to go down nearly as much, so it's going to be quite high in here. So because pulmonary venous pressure has gone up, and of course pulmonary arterial pressure has gone up, this means that the pressure inside these pulmonary capillaries goes up. And this leads to something called pulmonary edema, which is actually extremely dangerous. So pulmonary edema is one of the very serious consequences of the heart failure process and one of the things that often kills people with heart failure. OK, so pulmonary edema. So what does this mean? This means fluid accumulation. Edema means fluid accumulation. And I apologise for the stupid English spelling of this. Uh, American English is far more sensible spelling. This is the spelling that I have been brought up with, so I can't help using it. Uh, but um, it is a stupid spelling, having that O there. Uh, anyway, if you uh, uh, want to use American English, just take off the O. So edema means fluid accumulation, and pulmonary edema means fluid accumulation in the um, pulmonary tissue. So what's going to happen is when you've got very high pressure in the pulmonary capillaries, fluid from the blood starts leaking out more than should, starts leaking out from the pulmonary capillaries, and it ends up in the alveoli spaces. So let me just draw a little picture of this. So if I do this here. So let's draw some alveoli. So here is an alveolus. Here's another alveolus. Um, so let's just put a few alveolar epithelial cells just for completion. Let's actually draw it properly. So these are two alveoli. They are lined by these tiny, thin little cells called alveolar epithelial cells, um, also called type 1 pneumocytes. And remember, there are a second type of pneumocyte, which is the much taller ones, and I'm drawing one now, which are the ones that secrete surfactant. But the ones that cover most of the surface area are the type 1 pneumocytes. So all of these cells, these are type 1 pneumocytes, that's a type 2 pneumocyte, here's another type 1 pneumocyte, here's another type 1 pneumocyte. So just a little bit of respiratory histology at the same time. These cells are called pneumocytes, pneumo means pertaining to the lung, site means cell, and there are two types of these, the type 1s, which are the really squamous ones, the really flat ones, there to try and create as small a diffusion distance for gases as possible, and then the type 2s, which secretes the factant, which is, of course, extremely important for keeping the alveoli open. So this is the factant. And these are, of course, sitting on a basement membrane, so I will draw this in. So here is their basement membrane. And then underneath that basement membrane, in the walls of the alveoli, you're then going to have the pulmonary capillaries. Okay, so here are the alveolar spaces. This is where the air is, um, so high oxygen um, and low carbon dioxide, hopefully. And now let me draw on the pulmonary capillary. So here, whoops, not like that. Let me go down to the thin pen. Okay, so here would be a pulmonary capillary in the wall, like so. And I'll just draw it simply as a tube rather than trying to show its endothelial cells. Okay, so the message here is this is the basic structure of the lung, and of course you have absolutely loads of these in, a, in each of the lungs. Okay, so the pulmonary capillaries are extremely close to the alveolar epithelium to make as small a diffusion distance as possible for oxygen to come in and carbon dioxide to come out. And what is now going to happen is fluid from the pulmonary capillaries is going to escape, okay, it's going to be forced out because of the high... Uh, pulmonary capillary pressure, and you're going to get fluid accumulation in the alveolar spaces, like so. So this is fluid accumulation. This is the pulmonary edema. What this means is that now it's more difficult for air to actually, well, for oxygen to actually get into the pulmonary capillaries and for carbon dioxide to get out. The diffusion distance is increased. So remember, we want oxygen to come in 
carbon dioxide to come out. But now, because of that fluid that's over the alveolar epithelium, the pulmonary edema, this is going to be much more difficult because the diffusion distance has gone up. So let me now add this onto the flow diagram. So pulmonary edema occurs, so pulmonary edema I'll put going up, and then we get diffusion distance going down, and this means that gas exchange is going to go down. Sorry, diffusion distance hasn't gone down. Diffusion distance has gone up, and this means that gas exchange is going to go down. So the amount of oxygen that's coming into the pulmonary capillaries is going to go down, and the amount of carbon dioxide that we're getting off the pulmonary capillaries going into the alveolar spaces is going to um, go down as well. Okay, and this is going to lead to, therefore, problems with the amount of oxygen in the arterial blood and the amount of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood. So this now leads to arterial blood having too low oxygen concentrations, so I'll put hypoxia, and also having too high carbon dioxide concentration, which is hypercapnia. So this means the arterial blood has too low oxygen, and this means that the arterial blood has too high carbon dioxide. And when the blood's um, composition or pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide changes in this way, this creates shortness of breath. This makes you short of breath. So this produces another key symptom of um, valvular heart disease, the shortness of breath. So SOB stands for shortness of breath. So this means that you'll feel as though you're not getting enough air into your lungs, you'll be struggling to breathe, you'll be laboriously breathing with your accessory muscles and you'll feel as though you're drowning if it's really bad. Um, but you'll, you'll, you won't feel at ease, you'll feel very restless and agitated and you'll be breathing continuously uh, to just stay alive. Okay, so this is called shortness of breath. And it's because of the fact that the amount of oxygen in the blood is too low and the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood is too high. So when this happens, when the amount of oxygen in the arterial blood goes down and the amount of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood goes up, that is measured by uh, chemoreceptors uh, or that are at different places around the body. And that tells the brain that there's a big problem with ventilation and therefore it gives you the sensation of breathlessness, it gives you that sensation of panic, that you are drowning, that you need to breathe much harder. Okay, so pulmonary edema is one of the major consequences of left-sided heart failure. Um, okay, so what do I finally want to go over? Ah, there's one last thing that I want to talk about for heart failure, which is that you get uh, the increased activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, and I think I will actually stay here. This is a nicer place to be working than right over there, because we're much closer to the cardiovascular system model. Okay, so one more piece of information about heart failure. So, we've discussed that when you get valvular heart disease, you're going to get cardiac output going down. So, valvular heart disease leads to cardiac output going down. And this is fundamentally what happens in all of heart failure. So whenever the heart is going through a failing process, it means that one of the chambers, at least, is struggling to pump blood, and that means that cardiac output is going to go down. So any sort of heart failure process is always going to lead to cardiac output going down. And I know I've talked about how, over here, how, you know, there is some sort of compensation for this. The sympathetic nervous system goes up, you get tachycardia and inotropy, which helps to bring cardiac output back up. It compensates for it to an extent. It doesn't bring it quite usually back up to what it should be, okay? So it will bring it up further than it was, than it would have been if this wasn't present. If we took all of this away, cardiac output would be much reduced, but it doesn't quite bring it up to the healthy level, so you still end up with cardiac output being too low overall. So yes, this does compensate, but it doesn't compensate completely. So overall, in any heart failure process, you're always going to have reduced cardiac output. Now, that will therefore lead to mean arterial pressure being lower than it should be. So mean arterial pressure is reduced. And um, we've seen one of the big responses to mean arterial pressure being reduced, which is the increase in sympathetic output to the heart. There is another major response to mean arterial pressure being reduced that 
uh, is going to be activated chronically when the mean arterial pressure is reduced chronically. And I should add that these are going to be chronic reductions in cardiac output and chronic reductions in mean arterial pressure. And this is that the renin angiotensin aldosterone system increases in activation. So RAAS is going to be activated further. So let's now discuss the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And what this is overall going to lead to is blood volume going up. This is its response to blood pressure being too low, that we need more blood. And this leads to another one of the major features of heart failure, which is uh, peripheral edema. And of course, it will make pulmonary edema worse if you've got left-sided heart failure. So the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And actually, I'd just like to say something before um, we go any further with this, something that I missed out earlier. I've talked about how left atrial failure will lead to right heart failure. I just want to make clear that usually if you've got right heart failure, it doesn't lead to left heart failure. So let's say you've got right atrial failure. And you might think, couldn't we apply the exact same argument as we had here to say that it will cause left-sided heart failure? So couldn't we say, this will now lead to blood backing up in the venous system, uh, therefore mean venous pressure will go up, therefore less blood will flow through the peripheral capillaries, therefore mean arterial pressure will go up, and therefore the left heart will fail. So if, for instance, you had tricuspid stenosis, let's say, that was making the right atrium fail, wouldn't that now lead to left ventricular failure? And the answer is not usually no. And the reason is that you have to understand that this venous system is absolutely enormous, far more enormous than the pulmonary venous system. There is a huge volume of blood in your veins. So when the right atrium fails and blood backs up into the venous system, it negligibly increases the pressure in the venous system. So you're not going to get a massive increase in mean venous pressure, okay? And therefore, you're not going to get that much reduction in um, flow through the peripheral capillaries uh, due to this going up anyway. And therefore, you're not going to get the arterial pressure going up. And you also have to remember that actually the arterial pressure usually goes down because overall cardiac output has gone down and that's going to mean that the arterial pressure has gone down. So right heart failure usually actually leads to the arterial pressure going down, not going up. Um, and uh, therefore you don't get left ventricular failure because the left ventricle is now pumping, you know, the left ventricle is fine if we're just talking about right atrial failure, and it's now pumping blood into an arterial system with a lower pressure, so it's having an easier time, so it's not going to fail. So left heart failure does lead to right heart failure, but right heart failure without left heart failure does not usually lead to left heart failure. Okay, so just to make that clear, so let's now go back to our discussion of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So I've discussed that whenever you've got some reason to have heart failure, generally what happens is chronically the cardiac output is reduced. Even with the sympathetic nervous system trying to compensate, still the cardiac output is chronically reduced, and therefore the mean arterial pressure is chronically reduced. And this is going to activate another system besides just the sympathetic stimulation to the heart, called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And this is a system that involves the kidneys. So let me just draw a little picture of the kidneys. So I'll just draw one kidney. So here is a kidney. So when mean arterial pressure goes down, what that is going to lead to is it's going to lead to the amount of blood going through the kidneys being reduced. So this is going to lead to kidney perfusion going down. And the kidneys have a response to that. They don't like the amount of blood going through them going down at all. And what they interpret it to mean is that, of course, mean arterial pressure has gone down, but what do they think caused the mean arterial pressure to go down? Generally, they think it is because you have lost a huge amount of blood. And this is absolutely fantastic in a uh, young, healthy person, because one of the major things in a young, healthy person that would lead to mean arterial pressure collapsing down is a massive hemorrhage, losing a huge amount of blood. It doesn't work so well in someone with some reason for heart failure, so where the heart isn't working properly, such as if someone's got power through the heart disease that's causing mean arterial pressure to be chronically too low. So, the kidneys use their same old response, expecting that the reason that mean arterial pressure has gone down is that 
uh, you've had a massive hemorrhage, and therefore they activate this renin-angiotensin aldosterone system, which brings blood volume back up. So let's just discuss um, what this is actually going to entail. So kidney perfusion goes down. Their response to this is to start the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and this system is very aptly named because it starts off with renin. So they are going to release into the blood an enzyme called renin. I'll just change colour because I'm getting a bit bored of green. So it starts with the kidneys releasing renin into the bloodstream, which is an enzyme. So here is my basic picture of renin. So this is going to go into the bloodstream. Uh, the kidneys have released it because the kidney perfusion has gone down, because mean arterial pressure has gone down, and this is going to kickstart the entire system. Now, renin is going to work on a protein within the blood called angiotensinogen, which is put in there by the liver. So let me just make a little bit more space, and then we'll um, draw this. Okay, so another player then. Here is the liver. Basic picture of the liver. So, liver here. The livers, the, sorry, the liver, uh, produces a protein, which I'll put here, called angiotensinogen, and I'll try and fit its massive great name in here, angiotensinogen, and it's worked. Okay, so the liver produces a protein called angiotensinogen, which in its form does absolutely nothing, so it just floats around in the blood, it's a precursor to an active protein. It's waiting for the kidneys to release renin, which they now have done, they've increased their release of renin, and now what's going to happen is a lot of the angiotensinogen in the blood is going to be converted by the renin into angiotensin 1. So let me now put this here. So in red here, this is the breakdown product by the renin of the angiotensinogen, and this is angiotensin 1. Okay, so the liver releases angiotensinogen all the time, that's just floating around the blood doing nothing, then when the kidneys up their release of renin, the renin works on the angiotensinogen and it breaks it down into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 still is not the major active one, and it's going to be converted further into angiotensin 2. So this is now going to be converted further into pink molecule here, which is angiotensin 2. Okay, and angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2 by a very famous enzyme called the angiotensin converting enzyme, or for short, the ACE enzyme. And this is the target of ACE inhibitors that are used in the treatment of high blood pressure. And I'll discuss once we've finished talking, the system, why, uh, talking through this system uh, why uh, ACE inhibitors are effective at treating blood pressure. So this is angiotensin converting enzyme. So all the drugs that end in pril are ACE inhibitors, ramapril, captopril, enalapril, trandolapril, uh, lisinopril, perindopril, there are loads of them. Angiotensin converting enzyme, or the ACE enzyme. Right, and I'll just draw a little picture of ACE here so it can be in pink as well. So here it is. Now where is ACE? Well, it's on the surface of endothelial cells all over the body, but particularly in pulmonary capillaries, actually. However, don't say ever that it's only in the pulmonary capillaries. That's a mistake people often make, that angiotensin-converting enzyme is only on the surface of the endothelial cells in the pulmonary capillaries. It's not true. It's on the surface of endothelial cells all over the cardiovascular system, so many capillaries. So I'll just put a little endothelial cell here. So remember, endothelial cells' uh, apical membrane, so this is the apical membrane facing the lumen of the blood vessel, and just to orient it completely, I'll put my famous basement membrane on. So here is the basement membrane that it's attached to. So the apical surface of endothelial cells is not completely smooth and featureless. Instead, you've got loads of things attached here, and one of the things you have attached is angiotensin-converting enzymes, and these, when they see angiotensin-1 molecules that have been produced by the renin molecules, convert them to angiotensin-2 molecules. Okay, now angiotensin-2 is the active one. It's going to go and do something. So, 
Uh, one of the major things it now, whoops, never mind, I'll just have a thick arrow. One of the major things it now goes and does, and the one that I'm really interested in here, is that it goes to a layer of the adrenal cortex and triggers the release of um, uh, aldosterone. So let me draw now a picture of the adrenal glands. So remember the adrenal glands, you have two of them and they sit atop the kidneys and they have this sort of shape. So the kidney would be here underneath it. And it's a bit out of scale from what I've just <laughs> represented as the kidney. The kidney would be much bigger than it. Okay, and remember, so this is the adrenal gland, one of the adrenal glands. So this is an adrenal gland. Remember, adrenal glands have two major portions, a cortex and a medulla. So I'll draw that in now. So this bit at the center, this is the medulla. So medulla, I think, is Latin for middle, but don't quote me on that. So this is medulla. And then the bit around the outside is then the cortex, which I, again, I think is Latin for the outer portion of something. So this is the cortex. So the cortex of an orange is the orange peel, the medulla is the bit inside. Okay, now the adrenal medulla releases adrenaline, um, whereas the adrenal cortex releases all sorts of steroid hormones, and there are three major layers of the adrenal cortex. So I'll split them up now. So here are the three separate layers of the adrenal cortex, and we are interested in the outermost one, this one here, which is called zona glomerulosa. And this consists of lots of little cells. I'll draw one of these little cells here. So lots of boring little cells like this, which can secrete a steroid hormone called aldosterone. Now, just for completion, let me talk about the names of the other two layers of the adrenal cortex. So the other layers are the zona reticulara, sorry, reticularis and the zona fasciculata. So the one in the middle here is the zona fasciculata, fasciculata, and then the bottommost one facing into the adrenal medulla here, that is the zona reticularis. Now the zona fasciculata, it releases um, cortisol, glucocorticoid hormone, so another steroid hormone, very important hormone. Whereas the zona reticularis, it secretes androgens, so sex hormones, sex steroids. Okay, but we're interested in this one, the zona glomerulosa, so the outermost layer of the adrenal cortex. So, continuing on the pathway, angiotensin 2 will activate these cells of the zona glomerulosa, and they will now spit out yet another hormone, another hormone into the bloodstream, and what colour shall I have this in? I think I'll have it in this colour. So here's another box. This one's a steroid hormone rather than a protein, whereas all the others, angiotensinogen, angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2, they were all proteins. Okay, so this is this box is going to represent aldosterone. So the adrenal glands, zona glomerulosa, releases aldosterone and it started with the kidneys, it now ends with the kidneys. Aldosterone goes to the kidneys and causes water retention. So it makes the kidneys make more concentrated urine and save the water. So, so water retention. And this is perfect if you have indeed had a hemorrhage. If the reason that mean arterial pressure has gone down is that you've had a hemorrhage, it's absolutely brilliant that you've activated this system further because you're now going to get water retention and that can replace the fluid that you've lost. That can bring blood volume back up. So what you're now going to get is blood volume BV going up. Now, just before I go any further, let me explain why angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, can be used to treat uh, high blood pressure. So, um, Basically, this system, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, it is on all the time to a little extent, okay? All that's happened here is that its activation has become much bigger. The kidneys have suddenly released loads of renin and its activation has become much bigger. So, ACE inhibitors work to treat um, hypertension by inhibiting the amount of this that's always on, and therefore they lead to the kidneys re releasing more fluid, and therefore you bring blood volume down a little bit, and that helps to reduce blood pressure, because of course if you reduce blood, pre uh, blood volume, fundamentally you've now got less, less blood in the blood vessels, and that's going to lead to a reduction in blood pressure. 
In addition, you have to acknowledge that angiotensin II has other roles, and another role of it is that it actually leads to constriction of arterioles all over the body. So I might just add that on as another function of angiotensin II. It's not incredibly important for what we're discussing here, um, but it is there, and it's very important in understanding why ACE inhibitors play such an essential role in our management of hypertension. So this causes arteriolar constriction all over the body. And of course, arteriolar constriction uh, will lead to um, total peripheral resistance going up, and therefore that will lead to blood pressure going up. So that's actually very helpful in, with regards to um, activating this to bring blood pressure back up. But you have to remember this is always on, to some extent, keeping arteriolar constriction and keeping blood volume at a high. Uh, so if you inhibit that, you can help to treat high blood pressure. Okay, so that's why uh, ACE inhibitors are useful in the management of hypertension. Let's now go back to what we were actually discussing. So this being involved in heart failure, particularly heart failure caused by valvular heart disease. Okay, so we are going to get this system activated in response to the chronically low mean arterial pressure. And the major consequence of this is that it's bringing blood volume up. And that's a fantastic response if you'd had a hemorrhage, but you haven't had a hemorrhage. It's a problem with the heart that has lead, led to the mean arterial pressure being too low, not a problem with blood volume. So you're now going to elevate blood volume far too high. And what that is going to now lead to is it's going to lead to blood pressure going up all over the place, but particularly the place that blood pressure is now going to increase that's significant is in the main venous system, because this is the system with the most volume. So most of this new blood that you're creating is going to end up in this venous system, basically. And now the mean venous pressure will increase. Now, it might not increase by that much. The absolute amount might be small, but when you think about how much by what fraction it will increase. Say it increases by five millimeters of mercury, that's not that much, but that means it's doubled overall. So the fraction by which it increases, the percentage by which it increases might be, you know, severe. Okay, so the major thing that this is now going to lead to is mean venous pressure going up, and now this is going to lead to peripheral edema for the same reason as when we discussed um, pulmonary edema. If the pressure here has gone up, that means that the pressure in the peripheral capillaries is going to go up. You're now going to get fluid coming out of the peripheral capillaries that wouldn't have previously been coming out, and therefore you're going to get fluid accumulation in the peripheral tissues. So this now leads to peripheral edema. So you get fluid accumulation in the peripheral tissues. So peripheral edema. Now, the major places that this fluid will accumulate, uh, think about gravity, it ends up accumulating um, in the ankles. So, one of the common places where you get peripheral edema is in the ankles. So, this might lead to ankle edema. And uh, another place is in the lower back, so sacral edema. And what happens is you just get fluid accumulation there. So just drawing a very crude picture of this. If this was your ankle previously, it might now go to this. It becomes swollen. And it's a very hard swelling. It's not like fat, which is soft and um, flabby. Instead, it's a really hard swelling. The skin is completely stretched and it's just fluid there. And you can press down on it and it'll come back up. Um, and that's ankle edema, and this is one of the classic features of someone with heart failure, that you get this peripheral edema, and it's because of the fact that in chronic heart failure, the cardiac output is reduced, because fundamentally that's what the disease is all about. The heart is not working properly, cardiac output is reduced. That leads to mean arterial pressure being reduced chronically. It activates this renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and this system is stupid. It brings blood volume back up, which is fantastic in a young, healthy person where the only reason for mean arterial pressure going down is a massive hemorrhage, but it's not good in someone with a big heart problem because it's now just going to lead to fluid accumulation and that fluid has to go somewhere, so it ends up accumulating in the peripheries. If you have left heart failure, then this is going to make the pulmonary edema worse. So if you've got left heart failure, we know that 
blood's going to back up into the pulmonary venous system and the pulmonary arterial system, this will make these pressures even bigger now if we've got even more blood, uh, and therefore it will make the pulmonary edema worse. If you don't have left heart failure, then this rise in blood volume shouldn't cause the pulmonary edema. You see, if you've just got right heart failure, let's imagine you've just got right heart failure and the left heart's fine, then the left heart will keep the pulmonary system clear of blood and therefore will stop the pulmonary edema. This is the one that's not functioning properly, so you'll get reduction in pulmonary arterial pressure. This will be taking all the blood from the pulmonary venous system, so you're not going to get pulmonary edema, you'll get the peripheral edema. Whereas in both, uh, always generally in heart failure, you get the peripheral edema because the major place where this increased blood volume is going to go is into the uh, systemic venous system. Okay, so that was a long discussion of heart failure. Uh, it's a really important thing to understand, and it is a major consequence of valvular heart disease. I would now like to attempt a summary of it, so let's have a go. So, heart failure results anywhere where a chamber is struggling to actually pump blood. And it's a response that we don't fully understand. It's called pathological hypertrophy. And what happens is the cardiomyocytes get bigger. They hypertrophy. That's what hypertrophy literally means. It refers to a cell getting bigger. And this, at first, helps because it makes the chamber stronger initially. These new cardiomyocytes, these bigger ones, are actually stronger initially. However, over a long period of time, and for reasons that we don't understand, nature hasn't quite perfected this. Um, they lose the ability to contract completely. And there is a lot of research into why they lose the ability to contract completely and whether we can create drugs that will reverse this change. Okay, uh, so it means that you start up a vicious cycle of the chamber becoming weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. We've then discussed that if you have ventricular failure, it will lead to the atrium next to it failing. And if you've got left atrial failure, it will then back up and cause right heart failure, right ventricular failure, and right atrial failure. If you've just got right-sided heart failure, so either just right atrial failure or right ventricular and right atrial failure, it doesn't generally lead to left ventricular failure for reasons that we've discussed. This system is massive. We know that overall in heart failure, the cardiac output goes down, so the left, why would the left ventricle be struggling to pump blood into this arterial system that now has a lower pressure? Okay, uh, we talked about the fact that if you do have left atrial failure and blood backs up in the pulmonary um, system, it's going to lead to pulmonary edema, which will then lead to bad gas exchange, which will then create breathlessness, which is another major symptom of people with heart failure. Finally, we've discussed that because of this heart failure process and the cardiac output being reduced uh, chronically, you get reduced mean arterial pressure chronically, that activates um, permanently the renin angiotensin aldosterone system at an elevated level and it leads to fluid retention so blood volume goes up that blood ends up in the systemic venous system raising the mean venous pressure and therefore you get um, increases in peripheral capillary pressure and therefore you get fluid accumulating in the peripheries particularly in the ankles and sacral region Okay, so that is one of the major consequences of valvular heart disease, heart failure. In the next video, we will start the discussion of the pathogenesis of stenosis and regurgitation of the four heart valves. So what pathological processes can actually fundamentally lead to these problems in the first place?